Hi. Hi and welcome. Thanks for tuning in late in the program. Hopefully you are all enjoying the conference. My name is Mario Rodriguez and I lead enterprise at GitHub. In this session, we're going to do a quick lap around the different products of our platform. It will feel a little bit like a sprint around a track. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I want to talk about is our love for enterprise and how all enterprises also need love. Now, um, all jokes aside, um, enterprises care a lot about things and we want you to build like the best teams out there. That means giving you agility, giving you scalability, giving you innovation and openness of the world's best software teams. You also, as an enterprise, want to attract the best talent and you want to make uh, your developers and software teams happy. To do that, you need a platform and you need a community power platform. Um, so over here, what you're seeing is a set of the pillars that we have on that platform. So for example, code to cloud, security, insights, and all of that is on top of an amazing enterprise foundation. Again, I wanna stress one thing, although you see a lot of features and products over here, the common thing running across all of them is that community power. GitHub is a community and it's a platform of communities. And it is important that everything we do actually is grounded on that. It's what differentiates us at the end. So with that, let's actually, be, you know, Codespaces uh, has been so uh, successful um, since, or, you know, there's been a lot of buzz lately um, today on it. So I want to actually go a little bit off track and do Codespaces first. Uh, so with Codespaces, um, you get a world-class editor running in the browser. Um, that is VS Code. Uh, it is backed by a dev container in the cloud. So you don't have to actually be running any of your machine. You don't have to be configuring anything. All you have to do is hit code and start coding. Um, it also has a, because it's powered by VS Code, it also has a built-in debugger. It has a runner. It has um, all of your dot files automatically synced, and it could actually end up scaling with compute options. I've been looking at Twitter, Hacker News, and a couple other places. Um, and one of the things that got asked is, does it work on an iPad? And one of the designers, uh, Joel, so thank you so much, Joel, for doing this, um, was able to record a quick demo of that. So this is kind of like hot off the presses. I changed the entire presentation to be able to do this first. And I just want to show it to you. So let's see if this works. And if it doesn't, please, someone tell me because it's a video. So over here, you see an iPad. I'm actually gonna go back a second so you can see that it was actually an iPad run. I'm gonna hit code, uh, code with code spaces. And over here is preparing your container. It is in uh, what is loading right now, everything in that repo. And this is just a simple application that Joel was um, playing around a little bit. It's called Pass Hole. And it's all about the frustrations. It's a puzzle game. Uh, created to mimic the lovely world of frustrating password rules. So what he's doing right there is just running npm start. Again, this this took like less than five seconds, I think, to start. Um, and then he was able to actually make that code, deploy it to production. Uh, he's copying where that is deployed. And voila, you are able to play the game. I think he's going to put a couple of things there. And one by one, eventually you get a password that you could utilize in this site. But there you have it. Code spaces. Um, it's uh, the world class editor, again, VS Code running in the browser, backed by Dev Container. This is going to change how we all code in the future, how we all interact with different communities. And it works in your iPad. So now you have no excuse. So let's continue. Uh, that was that demo. Uh, let's let's get back to our normal schedule. Uh, and where I wanted to start our first lab was in the enterprise foundational items. And you're probably going to notice a theme across all of these things. And I'm going to pause for a second and see if you get it. Um, and if you guessed administration, you are right. All of these things have to be about administration at scale. When we think about foundational items, we want we think a lot about that administrator persona. You know, all the way from simple user and org management uh, to very complex rules like IP allowed list. So with that in mind, what I wanted to do was just give you a quick demo on some of the things that maybe you are not familiar with. So over here, I have 
Avocado Corp. Avocado Corp is an enterprise. It's not an organization. It is not uh, a user account. It's an enterprise. Just like you have org accounts and user accounts, there's this concept that we have at GitHub that is called an enterprise account that our enterprise users can get. Um, so since this yesterday was Cinco de Mayo, I have Carmen shows GitHub over here with a little thing. And I also have another one. Let's see if we could find it. Oh, it already came back. So Plato de Agua got it. So that's a good one as well. So um, as you can see in the enterprise, you have a name, you have a little bit, um, you have a logo as well. You can see all the organizations that belong to your enterprise. Uh, so no longer you have to understand or, and remember, oh, what are all the orgs of my enterprise? You get a single plane of class that allows you to see it. Um, so I could click on this. I could find one if I want to, like for example, guacamole mall. So if I just do this, it automatically filters it as you would expect. Not only do you get to see the organizations, uh, something that I think is equally as powerful is being able to see all of the members uh, across all of these organizations that belong to your enterprise. Um, you could also filter this. So I'm gonna find myself really quick. And there it is, here I am. I could click on myself and look at that I'm an enterprise account owner. Um, I'm also an organizational member, and I belong to an enterprise server. So yes, you could hook up with GitHub Connect, an enterprise server in with this, enter, um, this enterprise account, and you're going to be able to see use across both of them, not only in your cloud presence, but also in your on-premises presence. And, you know, it kind of gives you that hybrid view that a lot of us want. So if I go back to members, another thing that you could see, again, across all of your organizations and repos, is the outside collaborators. Um, so again, the same thing, you're able to kind of search through them, be able to even see the visibility if it's public or private. So if I wanna see all of the public ones, I could see that. In this case, the majority of my outside collaborators are on private repos. And as you know, private repos, um, we recently launched free private repos uh, for uh, organizations. So that's um, also something that belongs in the enterprise as well. So. Uh, administrators, you're able to see the administrators. One of the cool things uh, for you to know is that there is this thing called billing managers at the enterprise level. So these are people that will not be able to access all of the goodness that you see over here, but they're only they're going to be able to access everything that has to do with the build and be able to administer that. So who are the users that um, you're paying a license for, how much you're paying for things, um, even your consumption meters like actions and packages. So we have a role for them called billing managers. In policies, um, this is just the beginning of what we're going to be able to do in the future. But over here, you're going to be able to uh, say who um, can create repositories, for example, how you actually want policies around forking, invitations, even action execution. So like that, you don't want to be trusting things from the outside, only the things inside of your organization. Then you're able to set that over here as well. Um, one of um, another policy um, that is important um, is IP allow list. Um, we did this recently, and over 200, organiz uh, 200 enterprises are using this feature at the moment. And, and it is what you guess. You're able to define these are the IP um, that I trust that come from my network, and no one else in the public internet will be able to access then the organizations that belong to this enterprise. So pretty cool. Um, again, very advanced set of scenarios. And auto log is another feature that gets requested a lot. So if I want to see, for example, all the repository management across the enterprise, then I'm able to do that over here. Um, no more. There's also an API uh, around this, and there's an export in case you get audited. You're able to export these to CSV um, or into JSON. Um, but one of the things that we could ask a lot is, you know, I just want to be able to see across all of the organizations, the enterprise, what is happening uh, from an audit perspective. And this is the view for you. So that is a little bit of a demo into it. Um, there's one more thing, enterprise license that we have that, you know, if you have different license types, for example, our partners, we, we partner with Visual Studio um, and you can able to purchase a set of those licenses as well. And over here, you could even administer your server licenses if you have made that. Um, and as I said before, you could connect through GitHub Connect your enterprise servers into the um, enterprise and be able to see them and manage them here too. So with that, let's go back. Another great announcement that we made today is GitHub Private Instances. So think about this as a 
the most secure and compliant way of actually consuming GitHub in the cloud. Uh, we created this for highly regulated industries. Uh, as you could expect, it's a fully managed, isolated cloud solution. Uh, it has bring your own key encryption. It has private connections. So it's kind of a little bit more advanced than IPY listing. We're able to deploy this any place, anywhere in the world. So it actually meets EU uh, model class laws and data sovereignty. Um, and it also provides backup retention on our archiving. So a lot of the highly regular industries need to keep a set of backups, sometimes of up to 10 years. Uh, so this allows us to do that. And we will apply for a lot of compliance standards as well. So we're able to meet um, them for the customers. So that is GitHub Private Instances. Let's do our second lap. And our second lap is around code to cloud. Um, so we got all the, from a code perspective, we got everything covered. You know, you got repos, you got issues, you got boards. We just announced code spaces, which is amazing. But over the last year, I know thing that we have been doing is also filling in those DevOps workloads and being able to give you a code to cloud solution as well with the introduction of actions and packages. Um, now, actions and packages, you know, and I understand this slide is, is you know, it has a lot of text and I don't want you to remember everything that is here, but you know, there's a lot to both of these products. So I wanna make sure that I included them in here. But there's four words that I want you to get out of this. Uh, one of the, the first two is enterprise grade. Both of these are ready for you to be able to utilize at an enterprise um, grade level. Um, you know, they actions today, I think, does over 30 million builds. Um, so, so it has enough scalability um, to actually meet anything that you throw at it. The second thing is community power. And I would say there's 3,400 actions already available in our marketplace for our community. Um, and, it, and, and that's kind of the beauty of it. You don't have to do everything from scratch. You could just utilize what is out there and then put a workflow together that really meets the needs of your enterprise. So with that, let's maybe do a quick demo so you can see a couple of them. So over here, I have a pull request. It's a very simple pull request. Um, and what happened is that we forgot Ruby, the most important language. So, you know, Given that we're GitHub, we're very sad about that. So we're going to push something to production as quickly as possible to rectify this. Um, and what you can see over here in the timeline of the pull request is that we run a, we run a set of workflows. The first one that we tried to deploy to um, staging actually ended up failing. But then after that, we were able to succeed and deploy this into our stage environment. Um, and then after that, we went ahead and after we did a couple of testing, we deployed to production as well. So we accomplished this with two quick actions. Uh, so let's go into another tab. I'm in the actions tab now. You can see here deployed to staging. That's one of the workflows. Um, if I go into the deploy command and specifically, you're going to be able to see the workflow, the workflow file. Very simple one. Um, you know, it starts first uh, by actually doing an Azure login because we're going to be deploying this uh, into Azure. Um, so, and this uses is what lets you know what is the action that from the community that we're using. So in this case, Azure created this login action. From there, uh, we end up using this one, which is deployment action. Um, and then we end up actually tagging at the end uh, with this a comment in that pull request. So you can see Peter Evans and you can see CH norm, CHR norm. Um, these are the actions that we're using. Again, these were not created by GitHub. These were not created by us, not even the one that uh, we're using in Azure. Uh, these were created by the community. So if I go into this one, which is called deployment status, you can see it right here. It's a public repo. Everyone can see what it does, what, you know, you could even recommend the fix and provide a pull request. Um, and if I click on him, on Chris Norman, then you're going to be able to see what he's been up to as well. And again, this is uh, a thing that you know he probably needed and that he contributed to the community. Same thing with Peter. So if we go to the one from Peter, creator update comment, uh, this one is one that we guess use a lot and we see a lot of people using. Um, very simple actions um, as well um, and available in the marketplace. And But Peter is not a GitHub employee and he's a software and engineer architect. I treasure data, but he has contributed this to the community and we are using it extensively. So thank you so much. So if I go back, I could see that, and not only that, in this comment, I was able to 
Um, go ahead and put the link to production. So if I just click on that, I'm able to get to production. So just think about that. Just by a pull request and a set of workflows, we're able to then deploy to staging, put something automatically in that pull request that says, here's the link. You don't have to search in a thousand places to be able to see, okay, where is this deployed to? And then if someone else has deployed that to production, then there's another workflow that ends up creating another uh, another. Um, another comment and saying, hey, this is now deployed to production. And again, I have everything available to me right there. Um, and all of this is powered by our, our, our community. So thanks each and every one of you. So let's go back. Another announcement we made today, which I'm very excited about, is that all of this power now is coming on premises and is coming to GitHub Enterprise Server later in the year. Um, so at the, at the moment, all this power is available to you in the cloud and our enterprise. Every time I go into conversations, our enterprise server customers are like, that's amazing. We're using it. You know, the majority of them have a hybrid kind of uh, deployment. We're using it right now for a lot of projects. We all want that power on premises. And we, we're doing that thanks uh, to the team uh, for getting this done very quickly. And hopefully you'll be getting it very later this year. So let's proceed. Our next lab is around insights. Um, insights is very, uh, it's an interesting thing. If you think about software development um, and companies that are becoming software driven, they want to understand how can I get better at actually producing software? So if you think about an architect, if you think about a painter, if you think about a software engineer um, as well, if you think about an athlete, we all want to get better at our craft. But today it's very hard to get the right insights, the right data to be able to do that, to be able to ask the right questions and then get those, you know, get the data and the answers and the insights to them. And that's why we're building GitHub Insights to allow all of us collectively uh, from a team perspective get better at our craft. Now, one of the things that I would say is that um, this can be sometimes viewed as dangerous, and we were very, very aware of that. So we want to focus on team and not individuals. And I'll repeat that again. The entire product of Insights is focusing on team and not individuals. We're not here to actually do being counting on individuals and be able to you know, provide data at the individual level. We want you to think about it at the team perspective. How is that team actually executing? And what are the metrics that they need to get better? So the key metric, we have around five key metrics to help you improve code review and collaboration. They're based on research that has been done in the industry. Uh, we have benchmarked a set of them, uh, but we also have allowed you to set goals so you can make it your own. Um, and then later coming this year, we cre uh, we're creating and sharing custom charts and metrics with the entire community, again, infusing that community power into everything we do. So let's do a quick demo. Mm -hmm. I am on Insights at the moment. And what you will see first is in overview, we actually share five key metrics that we think are very important uh, when it comes you know, to teams getting better at software development. Um, the first thing that you see is code review turnaround time. So you know, I'm a developer, I'm actually coding, I send this for review. The longest it sits on that review, then the longest it's not getting pushed to production. So if I think about an iterative, you know, iteration of okay, I have something, I want to push it to production, um, I want to learn from it, I want to do that again, and kind of getting this very, very nice loop. If it's just sitting in there and it's not getting reviewed, and I love getting reviewed by my teammates, um, then it's not actually creating that value. So we want to let you to actually shorten that as much as possible. In this case, um, I believe we have set a goal in, um, in December of less than three hours, and you're able to see which one are the ones that have met that goal or not. Uh, as a team, you could set this to 10 to start, you know, one day even to start, but um, you know, eventually you want to start getting it to less than three hours, less than an hour even. So time to open this is how long did it actually take me to code all of this and then ended up submitting that pull request. So again, we want to start minimizing that as much as possible. Um, that together will pull request size and work in progress and how much of the pull requests that are getting reviewed gets distributed to people is also something very important for you to get better. And again, all of these are about teams. These are, so if I go to the key metrics and click on them, I'm able to see, okay, uh, 17 hours on average, 
what is my success rate uh, for less than three hours, what mid goal and did not. And then I could start, you know, in my retrospective or in my stand up or anything like that, I could start actually asking questions on, okay, are we just bottleneck on something? Is there too much work? We could start getting better at it. And the goals, it, you know, allows us to make it our own. So same thing, we have time to open, we have pull request size. This was one of my favorites. You know, you probably as a developer hate getting pull requests that have 10,000 lines of code. Very, very hard to end up reviewing that. So, um, and then that goes together with work in progress and also code review distribution. Um, there's a lot more reports on it. Uh, I do want to show one that is one of my favorites too, because we get asked about this all the time, which is languages. Um, over here, you can see all of the rising languages, the, what is declining. Uh, many people do not even know at an organization perspective. Are we developing more in Rust, are we not? And how is that actually doing? How many people are doing it even? So pretty cool stuff. Uh, so um, the last lab is security. And you know we started our security journey, I think back in 2017 with security vulnerability alerts. Uh, from there, in, um, we introduced secret scanning. We have a lot of, um, you know, let's say you have an AWS token that you utilize in an API. You know, those get leaked a lot more than you know what you would uh, you would think. So we did something where if you check that in, we automatically contact AWS. They could then revoke that token, and then we let you know. So it's pretty cool stuff. We call that secret scanning. Um, Last last satellite, we did automated security fixes by the acquisition of Dependabot. We think of Dependabot as the Roomba; they just keeps your code clean. It you know it goes away, it goes in and says, okay, you need to update these dependencies, you need to do all of these things. So kind of keeps your house in order. And then at Universe last year in November, we started getting more into that community feel with GitHub Security Lab and advisory database. So okay, so we're uh, securing your dependencies. We are securing as well your. C Secrets, but what about your code? And that is where code scanning comes in. It seamlessly finds security vulnerabilities natively integrated into the developer workflow. It is powered by CodeQL, the world's most advanced semantic analysis engine. This comes from our SEML acquisition. And again, that community piece is essential in everything we do. So CodeQL is backed by 1,700 open source queries by leading security researchers. So you get all of these actions in a community around actions. You're going to have insights in a community and about insights, and you have security in a community around insights. All everything um, coming together to not only allow the open source to remain secure and productive and all of that, but also our enterprise customers can utilize it. So, with that, let me just give you a quick demo and we'll call it. So, in here, I could see. Um, you probably have seen this a couple of times, so I'm actually going to fast forward. So we're probably short in time. Um, I'm going to show you one really quick so you get an idea. So it's this one. So right here, integrated. You could event. You know, you could also integrate this into a pull request flow. Um, I'm able to. You know, I already had it uh, scanned and everything, and I'm able to see that I have a security vulnerability. Not only that, it tells me a lot about it. Um, it tells me even a recommendation, the example. Um, it shows me even what. I the past. So I can see over here, I'm marshalling this all the way into my Postgres database. So definitely something that we need to fix. Uh, but the beauty of it, again, is that community. So I could view source. And there you go. This is the query that found it. It's in our CodeQL Go repo, all accessible. You could even do pull requests against uh, CodeQL Go. And the more people submit queries and the more vulnerabilities we could find out there in the open and the more our enterprise customers can also benefit from that too. So, and with that, we are gonna give it a close. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of end where we started, with, which is a community powered platform. Um, we're doing all of this to really empower your teams uh, and allows you to transform your enterprise um, into a community enterprise. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mario, for that amazing tour around GitHub One. It was, it was extremely informative. And I remember what you said. You said you want us to take two words, enterprise grade, that GitHub Actions and Enterprise Server has enterprise grade. That means they can handle over 30,000 builds. And the second word is it's community powered. 
So we have four minutes for Q&A. I'm going to go straight into the first question. As an administrator on GitHub Enterprise Instance, this looks compelling. We have regulator concerns and retention as long as 35 years. I expect that long-term storage is considered as you improve the product. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. If they're talking about GitHub Enterprise, um, I'm sorry, GitHub Private Instances, um, that many years I have not heard. But yes, we'll work with our enterprise customers. We'll definitely work with our enterprise customers on this. Um, you know, where you're going to be able to actually store this in your own uh, object store. Uh, the main thing that we're facilitating is being able to take that backup and then feed it into you. So whatever you're using as your, you know, you could put it in cold storage, whatever you want to do, you could even print disks uh, and put them in a place. Uh, many enterprises have different ways that they want to satisfy that requirement. But but yes, we'll work with you and we'll able to actually give you the data that you need to satisfy those audits and those regulations. So Great. Chado, do you have any questions that you want to ask around GitHub One or shall I continue? Oh, I've got a question. I've been trying to get this question out since the conversation with Chris, so I'm hoping you can answer. It's okay if you can't. But uh, Chris mentioned something about self-hosted hosted runners that was also mentioned in the Arduino conversation. Could you talk more to that and what's possible there? Yeah, Forget definitely. So, yeah, yeah, de definitely. So, self-hosted runners, um, it, they're. It's a beautiful system, you know, like we already have runners that we could run your actions on, but sometimes you actually want to have an, a specific, let's say, uh, binary installed in, into that runner. You want to have an, a specific setup actually made because your build, you know, is very complicated. Um, and, you know, the way to accomplish that is through self-hosted runners. So you end up configuring an image, um, then we're able to call that, instantiate it, and be able to run the workflow in it. Uh, but again, it's preset to whatever you need it to be. Um, and we're just kind of administering being able to have the life cycle of that self-hosted runner um, or, or kind of the ability to call it and then get the information back after the run is finished or the workflow is finished. So what we see the most, um, maybe answering your question, we see self-hosted runners get used the most behind uh, the firewall, if you want to think, right? Like if I have something where my workflow needs to end up calling um, into you know, a system that is on premises or anything like that, we see that a scenario a lot. Um, or another kind of use case is again, something that, hey, my build, needs a lot of customization when it comes to binaries that are needed in that machine or a specific, you know, batch files are needed in that machine. And this is the only way to do it. So, you know, uh, versions of, of frameworks and things like that. So much to try. All right. Emoji, what's next? There is one question that people are very eager to know about. So the question goes, I think a bigger question isn't around when these features come to server. But when, but what's the plan for keeping the two products in sync in general? Yeah. It seems like a yeah, lot of development two isn't in sync. So what's our plan? Yeah, our promise, yeah, and you know, that, that's all fair. Um, so thanks for asking that. I, I do want to kind of make sure that everyone hears this is our promise is that all of the features that we do have in our cloud product, we're a cloud first company, right? It first launches in the yeah. cloud. Our promise is that those uh, features end up going on premises one quarter or two quarters after it ends up in general availability in the cloud. We're doing a lot of work right now to make sure that that is true. Um, so actions, um, you know, it's taken maybe a little bit longer than that quarter, uh, but it is something that we are committed of making it in. But going forward, what you should be expecting of GitHub is whatever, whatever the feature, and sometimes the feature cannot actually go into cloud because you know it's not uh, into on-premises because it was not meant for on-premises. But 99% of the features are meant for both of these flavors of deployments or topologies. So you should expect any feature one quarter to two quarters lag. Um, but but that's our promise to you. So our code bases are going to be the same. Uh, we're working a lot in kind of like the deployment topology of on-premises to be able to speed up that. All right, you've heard it here at GitHub Satellite Virtual 2020. Mario is committing to bringing everything to you in one or two quarters. Thank you, Mario, for that tour around GitHub One. <laughs>